guys, I have the best super cut for you I've brought you in a long time. There's a bunch of stuff here all going over in excruciating detail for old Donnie. Just how absolutely up the creek without a paddle he is based on his team's failure earlier today. Of course, we know his legal cases are weak, but you can make a weaker case even weaker if you're a dumb dumb like him and his attorneys. And that's exactly what happened. But it was also bad because afterwards he was so insane that two things happened. One, a CNN reporter interrupted him mid speech to call him a lying bastard, but also in less than 60 seconds, another CNN anchor host, whatever destroyed the entire legal apparatus of Trump. So watch all of this. It includes other things as well, going over the absurdity, but the supercut ends with those two pivotal, pivotal moments. Again, as I've been saying, the little secret, if you watch this all the way through and share it far and wide, Trumpers will see it in their YouTube feed and it will trigger them. So watch this all guys, the insane moments come up and my goodness, it destroys Donnie. We should note he, he basically threatened some sort of unrest or bedlam if the things didn't go his way. He didn't take any any questions. Harry, I want to talk about the to me, the sort of headline here. Uh, which were those clips we played. And the, and the headline comes from a hypo, a, you know, a hypothetical that appears in Jack Smith's own briefs, right? Which is to say the, the, the argument that Trump and his lawyers are making proves too much, obviously goes too far. It cannot be the case <laughs> under the Constitution and under the rule of law that a liberal democracy such as ours would allow it to be a, a possible to order SEAL Team 6 to assassinate a political rival and not face accountability, but for some impeachment and conviction. Cannot be. That is the headline. All three judges will reject that proposition. Basically, after Judge Pan asked that hypo about SEAL Team 6, Sauer, Trump's lawyer, was a dead man walking. He's going to lose. He should lose. The basic distinction doesn't, isn't cogent legally, historically, logically, et cetera. So in that sense, there's the satisfaction that this vampire of a claim will finally have a stake in its heart. But the, below the headline, Chris, there's a little bit more drama, I would say, because this was one of the cases in which the three judges were kind of probing different theories. At one uh, stage, Judge Henderson said, maybe we need to remand to ask Judge Chutkin this. They, had, they were probing different ideas, none of which was in lockstep with what Chutkin said. And the reason that matters, there's two reasons it matters. Depending on how they decide, even if they are unanimous, and I, you could see a sort of uh, concurrence here from Judge Henderson, but even if they're unanimous, it could really affect the prospects for a remand, and a remand might entail a subsequent round of appeals under the remanded standard by Trump and a little bit more delay. It also could affect whether the Supreme Court takes review. So that lower level, there is there was some drama, and I think people were basically not confident about the way in which the panel, the, the panel will reject his claim. They'll do it quickly. The exact rationale is a little bit uncertain, I'd say. There'll be bedlam in the country. It's the opening of a Pandora's box. You just <laughs> used the word bedlam. Will you tell your supporters now, no matter what, no violence? I'm joined now by three sharp legal minds, each bringing their own unique perspective to today's proceedings. George Conway, Elliot Williams, John Dean. Elliot, just to start things off, I think a question here is how expansively the judges could rule here and really what this could mean and also how soon we could know it seemed where they were leaning today, but how soon we could know what their decision is. I, you know, I think we could know relatively soon in legal terms. Now, again, that's not news cycle terms, so you know, we may not hear tomorrow, but certainly within days, if not weeks. Something uh, that people should know is that these judges have been preparing for this argument for weeks, if you know, perhaps even months. They would have had hundreds of pages of briefing from the attorneys, so they kind of might have had a sense going in as to where they were going to rule um, and are really just sort of refining and, and 
figuring out what their opinion is going to say. So I would be on the lookout for something within the coming days. Now, uh, in terms of how expansive it could be, um, exactly as your lead into this segment noted, Caitlin, it was pretty clear, uh, listening to the argument and having listened to a lot of these arguments over the years, it was pretty clear that the, you know Trump's team did not have the judges on their side. Uh, Judge Pan's question, particularly on that hypothetical, was just devastating um, because they did not have an answer to it. And there can it cannot possibly be the case that attorneys, or, or pardon me, that a former president could engage in whatever conduct he w- he wished and resign the next day and avoid any possible criminal uh, well, yeah. exposure. And, so, and, yeah. and to that overall argument, George Conway, I mean, you've practiced law as a conservative attorney for decades. You've argued before the Supreme Court. You played a central role in one of the key cases that defined the limits to presidential immunity. We could be in for an entirely new definition maybe here. But I wonder what you made of this assertion by Trump's team that the only way to hold a president accountable for crimes was to first have them convicted in an impeachment proceeding by the Senate. Well, the the short answer is what they were doing there was taking a bad argument, their immunity argument, and conflating it with another bad argument, which is something based upon the impeachment judgment clause, and mixing them all together in the hope of getting a stronger argument. And what happened was uh, the, the Trump attorney, Sauer, set a trap for himself that Judge Pan just completely, completely closed off. And she, she was, it was an intellectual tour de force by Judge Pan. Not only did she highlight the extreme nature of their position that a president might not be prosecutable for assassinating political rivals she did something else his exception his attempt to explain well you could hold a president liable was based upon that impeachment judgment clause he's he's misreading it by saying that if you can prosecute a former president if they were convicted by the senate Well, the problem was that completely is inconsistent with their main position, which is the president is absolutely immune. And let me elaborate just a little more on that. Their position that the president is absolutely immune immune from being prosecuted for official acts is stems from the notion that she repeated, Sauer repeated over and over again, that we must be, we have, we have to be afraid that there'll be political prosecutions. And then he's taking this other position, which, again, is nonsense by itself, but trying to mix it in by saying, but you could prosecute him if the Congress, which happens to be the most political body in, in, the, in, in, the, in the Capitol, um, says you can. So what he's saying on one hand is saying we can't have pro- presidents prosecuted because, of po- because it, it could be political. And then he's saying that the, the political Congress gets to decide. It made absolutely no sense. And I was there in the courtroom and and it was just it was devastating. You were in the courtroom today as these arguments were being made, George. Yeah, I was sitting way in the back. And um, but I, I could hear it. I could hear it pretty well, except for maybe Judge Henderson, whose voice was a little soft. But uh, I mean, it was absolutely it was one of those moments. And I'm writing a piece in The Atlantic tonight that should come out tomorrow where you know, before the I mean, it was like ten minutes into the argument when 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 Judge Plan just completely demolished uh, Trump's lawyer, and you knew right then you didn't have to hear anything else. I mean, the the lawyer for the special counsel's office could have just stood up there and talked for five minutes and nonsense and sat down, and he still would have known that he won. I mean, the the rest of, the rest of the uh, event was kind of anticlimactic after those exchanges well, and that she just played. The other I mean that bars future prosecution because he's already been tried. They're trying to claim this is double jeopardy. So they're all over the lot, Caitlin, all over the lot. So I take it you weren't impressed with the way Trump's attorney argued in court today? Underwhelmed. I I felt sorry for him, actually. Do you think that it means that they're going to rule against him? I'm convinced they will. I it would be it would be so stunning for Trump to succeed in this argument. I think it's a make weight argument where they're just trying to get delay, delay, delay. They're going to go for the full en banc hearing of the entire D.C. Court of Appeals. Then they'll lose there. Then they'll go up to the Supreme Court and they'll argue there. And pretty soon months will have passed and he hopes he's president and can somehow magically erase it all. Yeah, they're aiming for for a delay here. And Elliot, you know, you have worked across all, all three branches of government. You've been worked as a counsel in the Senate, multiple roles in the executive. That's what I was doing. 
are listening to former President Trump speaking there alongside two of his attorneys, at least one of them who was in the room, making that argument earlier with that three judge panel. Of course, a few fact checks and reality statements on what you're hearing there. There is no evidence of voter fraud. Many of courts have found that there has never been any evidence of it that Trump has been able to bring, despite what he is continuing to say there. It is still a notable comment coming six days before the Iowa caucuses in the 2024 election. Ellie Honig and Karen Agnifilo Friedman are back here with us. Ellie, I just wonder what you heard or what you made of John Laro, because he was coming out there and Trump echoed him, you know, at first trying to argue that this is, you know, President Biden who is, who is prosecuting Trump here. It's not. It's the Justice Department, who is also, as we just heard from a Democratic senator, also has been indicted, and the president's son. But on the argument itself, their takeaways from what happened inside that courtroom today, what did you make of that? Yeah, so a couple things I think we need to set the record straight on. First of all, Donald Trump just told us that DOJ made these remarkable, sort of shocking concessions. I don't think so. I think DOJ was consistent in their position, which is a former president can be indicted for something that he did that falls outside the scope of the presidency. I don't think they actually gave away anything. I think to the contrary, it was a little bit surprising to hear Donald Trump's lawyers go in there and concede that under certain circumstances, a former president can be prosecuted. We do have to address this point, this constant refrain that this is somehow Joe Biden going after Donald Trump. I mean, just so people understand, you have the president, who nominates the attorney general, who's then confirmed by the Senate. The attorney general, Merrick Garland, then put one more layer in and put Jack Smith in office as special counsel. And to be clear, there's no evidence of any communication between any of those folks, particularly Joe Biden. And Barr has agreed that he does not believe the indictment in Washington. He believes that it's a sound legal argument. He does not believe that it's... Uh, politically motivated. Yeah, That's Bar- Trump's attorney general. Bill Barr of all people, right? The, the last point that you heard from both is this Pandora's box floodgates concern. And, and I think it's a legitimate point. We heard it argued today. Where is the lie? Where would this end? The response that we heard from DOJ, which I think was quite effective, was there are safeguards in place. This isn't as simple as president doesn't like someone, boom, they're indicted. There are, first of all, prosecutors who have a duty to only indict people where they have provable evidence. You have grand juries who will have to review that evidence and return an indictment. You have then a trial, trial juries, of course, review for a proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And then finally, a court of appeals, like the one we just saw today. So it's a fair argument. I get where they're going with it. And you do have to be concerned about, will this open up some new chapter we don't like? But there are really important safeguards in place. I will say there was moments. He says he's immune. Presidents can't obstruct justice. He, he's, his intent wasn't corrupt. The case is moving too fast or moving too slow. It's an unfair venue. The judge is biased and so are the clerks. The juries too. He's never met her. He doesn't know her. He's, she's not his type. It was his personal account, political persecution, witch hunt, perfect phone call, the deep state. It wasn't an insurrection. He wasn't notified that it was a crime. His lawyers advised him, double jeopardy, the speech was peaceful, the students weren't defrauded, the Presidential Records Act, he was too busy. They were his documents. They're declassified. They aren't even classified at all. The First Amendment and the Fourth, the Fifth, the Sixth, and Tenth Amendments too.